Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Schweig, Missouri State Auditor. I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight to deliver the results of the audit of the school district here. Uh, I want to start off by saying I'm here with my media director, Spence Jackson. He will be helpful to any members of the media who are here. We also have our uh, audit manager, Kelly Davis, here, as well as Robert McCarthy, who is the auditor in charge. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to summarize the results of the audit that you have in front of you. Uh, I'll go through the findings one by one. Uh, we have a lot to talk about tonight, so I expect that I'll be speaking with you all for 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and then I will open it up to questions from you all. I think we have a microphone over here for anybody who has a question to come up and talk. Now, I do have a three and a half hour drive back to Jefferson City tonight. There's some bad weather on the way. So I'm going to cut off the questions after a few minutes. But we have a website you might want to jot down, moaudit, moaudit at auditor.mo.gov. If I can't get to your question, you can email us with that question. We will answer you promptly after the fact. Um, this, uh, this district is the 18th largest uh, school district in Missouri, operating revenues of $121 million. It's a large enterprise. Uh, and uh, we audit generally, when we do the audits, we focus on one year, but because of some of the things we found, we ended up going back eight or 10 years on some of them. But the focus of the audit is the year ending June 30th, 2014, the fiscal year. Uh, as our normal practice is, when we find serious problems, we will start to look further back. So you'll hear me talking about some practices that have been in existence for many years, in fact. Uh, but we focus generally on one year. Now, when I became auditor a little over four years ago, and I had the honor of starting to serve you all as a state auditor, I put in a grading system that had not been done before. Now, every entity we audit either gets an excellent, a good, a fair, or a poor. The criteria that, you, that are used to determine what that grade will be are published on our website, and they're very specific. Unfortunately, uh, the school district here tonight received a poor rating. It is the first school district I've audited in over four years that received a poor rating. So poor rating means there are serious and extensive management deficiencies occurring over a long period of time that require immediate attention and corrective action. The good news is, is that when we met with the, the board uh, and discussed with them the results of the audit a few weeks back, uh, we think that they recognize the seriousness and the level and the depth of the problems that were uncovered believe that they plan to correct all those problems. And, and to that effect, uh, which a couple of other school districts have done, uh, they're going to be setting up a, a website so that you can monitor their implementation of the recommendations uh, over uh, the next few months. Another thing we put in place when I became auditor is a follow-up team. Any entity that gets a fair or a poor on the grading system, we come back 90 to 120 days later. We look to see if the corrective action we asked for uh, occurred. Uh, and then we will issue a follow-up report so you will be able to see uh, whether the problems we're addressing here tonight have actually been remedied by the district. And because of the number of problems, we'll probably give them a little more than 90 days, but three to four months from now, we'll be back and we'll issue a second report so that you all can see uh, the level of compliance. Now, my objective here, I also say, is not to settle political disputes uh, or scores. Uh, all we're interested in in the auditor's office is identifying issues and correcting them. We also don't focus much on individuals. Uh, other law enforcement entities are around. Uh, they're here tonight. As you know, there's a, an FBI investigation going on. That limits to a minor degree what I can say tonight because we don't want to compromise uh, the results of that investigation. But I think you'll see I'll have plenty to say and plenty for you all uh, to think about uh, tonight. We expended over 2,000 hours on this audit. Uh, and we found uh, significant problems. Um, let, me, uh, let me go over now. Uh, you have the audit in front of you, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in the order of the audit, and I'm going to summarize what was in there. I won't say everything in there, but just give you an overall summary, and then you can read the audit itself to see all the details. Uh, the first finding relates to district compensation. We found that the district's use of salary schedules and a stipend system had resulted in a confusing, uh, inconsistently applied and poorly documented system of compensation, so bad, really the worst we've seen, that it almost w functioned as sort of a, uh, a slush fund outside the regular scope of board approval. And this went on for many, many years. Uh, salary schedules and employment contracts uh, were problematic. District officials did not provide the school board all the salary schedules for approval, and those that they did provide uh, were incomplete. Uh, for example, the Human Resources Director did not provide uh, the salary schedules for Hilliard Technical Center at all for board approval. They were eventually approved after the fact. 
Uh, those total $2.3 million just for the 2013 and 2014 school year alone. Uh, there were no individual salary schedules for parents as teachers, educators, or summer school teacher salaries. Uh, the district's placement or advancement of some employees on advanced salary schedules is not always documented in accordance with policy or the school board requirements. For example, uh, there was a warehouse supervisor promoted in August of 2013 from maintenance supervisor uh, salary schedule to technical director. However, the promotion was not supported by any documentation uh, detailing any additional duties, and that resulted in an additional $16,000 a year of compensation without any apparent increase in duties or qualifications for that job. And that's just one example of many you'll see uh, in the audit report, but we found that was uh, fairly common. There was no indication school board minutes or personnel files that the school board reviewed and approved. Uh, 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 there was, in, in many cases, none of these things were reviewed and approved by the school board. Uh, it also did not review certified teacher or administrator employment contracts. Uh, there were significant situations where uh, signatures were applied without the review of the school board. Uh, that's problematic to us as well. Uh, the school board also, pay, the school district also paid several employees in excess of their contracts. So you have written employment contracts that say a certain amount should be paid, and there were payments made in excess without uh, explanation. So I'll give you one example from the audit. Uh, which is the revised uh, contract for the controller said that she was to be paid at step nine of an assistant director's salary, but in fact was paid at step eight of a director's salary, which is the difference between $88,000 and $92,000 a year. Uh, so that was problematic as well. Perhaps the biggest problem that we found, and I think this is the biggest uh, issue we, we found here, was the payment of stipends. Uh, you all have heard already by reviewing in the media about $250,000 worth of stipends that had not been authorized. Um, we actually went back about eight years and found um, that there was over $25 million worth of stipends paid, either unapproved, unauthorized, or improper. Now, in some cases, there were proper stipends paid, but that $25 million is stipends that we found to be problematic over an eight-year period. And we believe, since there's not full documentation going all the way back to 2001, that that number could actually be in excess of $40 million. Uh, that's a startling sum of money. Uh, and I'll give you some examples uh, of what we found. So for example, uh, the district had um, uh, stipends totaling $3.8 million for the 2013-2014 school year. That's the main area that we focused on. Annual stipends totaled approximately $3.3 million for the past eight years, averaging a $3.3 million each of the past eight years. The school board did not approve approximately 30 of the 83 payroll system categories of extra duty and stipend payments provided just during the 2013-2014 school year alone. These were not included in the salary schedules that the district submitted to the board. Let me give you some examples, just a few examples. Night duty. For 2013-2014, there were $207,500 paid for night duty, which were not properly documented or properly approved. Superintendents count, and by the way, since 2001, that's $672,000 just for night duty alone, stipends. Superintendents Council, 2013-14, there was $72,000 paid. I think that's been made public previously. But if you go back to 2001, uh, the total amount is $579,000 paid to that group. Uh, there were some stipends simply labor, labeled as additional. It wasn't even described what additional was. You've heard about that. In 2013 and 2014, those totaled $168,000. But going back to two, the year 2000, we were able to identify $2.5 million in, quote, additional stipends without any particular explanation as to what they were for. In addition, payment amounts for several stipends that the board did actually approve uh, did not agree to approve salary schedules or employee contracts. So for example, some of those were for travel. Now, there are stipends allowed for travel, but there was a, these stipends that were paid did not concur with board policy or with the actual contracts. Travel, uh, $324,200 uh, in 2013 and 2014 that were problematic to us. But since 2000, that's $2.4 million that we found problematic. Longevity stipends. $215,000 in 2013, 2014, but you go back to 2000, the year 2000, $4.3 million that we found to be problematic. Coordinator stipends listed on salary schedules or employment contracts, but which had some issue with them, uh, totaled $118,000 for 2013 and 2014, and $1.6 million going all the way back to the year uh, 2000. Um, 
In addition, as you are well aware, there were travel allowances paid uh, to 54 employees in the past uh, fiscal year for $250,000. And in this case, the district did not amend the employees' contracts to account for the increase, and the school board only retroactively approved them when they were made aware of them in February of last year. The district also did not retain documentation for numerous employee stipends to justify payment for responsibilities performed outside their normal contract duties. In many cases, it appeared to us this was just extra pay for the work they were already required to do. One example is the superintendent's counsel. Uh, $9,000 stipends were given to seven people, but these people are in positions where they normally would be advising the superintendent anyway, and it appeared to us to be excess compensation that was not warranted. Uh, another example is uh, uh, a superintendent received a graduate stipend, but a graduate degree was already required to be hired. So why would you pay an extra stipend for doing something that you're already required to have when you get the job to begin with? And this is just a couple of examples of the audit details, uh, many others. Uh, we also asked current district officials why additional stipends were ever given to some employees. They totaled many thousands of dollars over the base salaries. Uh, in one case, uh, an HR employee had a base salary of 96000 and received almost $40,000 worth of stipends, and there was no clear explanation as to why that occurred. Uh, the district is also does not always contract for the number of days an employee is required to work. So, for example, an employee's job duties sometimes requires them to work more days than they're contracted for, requiring additional time stipends, which are legitimate, of course. Uh, however, in this case, they were often not in approved salary schedules or otherwise approved by the school board. So that's money that was probably deserved, but the processes and procedures for paying it uh, were not proper. The district also does not have policies governing several other stipend payments made to district employees, including those for obtaining certifications, attending meetings, and participating in professional development opportunities. This is the real, the most problematic thing we found. We were pretty much floored that you're talking about over $25 million in an eight-year period. And we think we can't give you an exact number all the way back to 2000 because the documentation is not complete, but it's quite possible it was over $40 million. Uh, additional compensation, not in the way of stipends. Uh, there were also some problems with some non-stipend compensation. Uh, for example, a uh, superintendent receives a $500 a monthly vehicle allowance and other employees receive various travel stipends, which is meant to be reimbursed for driving personal vehicles within the district for business. We made a calculation that some of these people would have to be driving 1,000 miles a month within the district to justify the amount that they were paid for their travel. Uh, overtime payment, there were some problems there too. Uh, board policy is not to pay overtime until an employee has actually worked 40 hours in a week. However, the district did allow some employees overtime when they took vacation and sick leave and included that in the actual time worked. That doesn't amount to a large amount of money, but again, it's a failure of proper uh, procedures. Several employees received additional amounts of overtime uh, to their no compared to the normal salary. Uh, one employee earned $18,000 of, of overtime on a base salary of $35,000. At some point when a lot of overtime is paid, and we see this with a lot of state agencies too, it's better and much more cost effective just to hire somebody else rather than pay the overtime. And we found some examples of that here in the school district. Every time we have findings, particularly with respect to this, this uh, compensation issue, we make recommendations. And again, uh, while it's sort of startling the amount of money involved, what we're interested in is fixing the problem. Uh, that's our objective. And so we've asked uh, that the board conduct a formal compensation study, revise their salary schedules, eliminate unnecessary stipends, of which a lot of them appear to be, provide additional oversight and approval for compensation decisions, and assure that amounts paid agree to contractual amounts authorized. The district has said they are committed to improving, they're committed to putting these recommendations in effect, and we'll be back in a few months to make sure that that actually uh, happened. Uh, overtime policies need to be fixed as well, uh, and the district said they will improve those, and we'll be looking at those when we come back as well. Uh, that's probably the most important thing we found, but there were a lot of other things, so I'm going to take some time going through them. They don't involve the same amount of money, but they do involve problems with the policies, procedures, and controls. Finding number two, if you look at finding number two in your, in your audit, um, is payroll procedures. We found that payroll duties are not always adequately segregated. It's very important that multiple people be involved in the payroll process. You never have one person controlling all the money. That can allow for mischief, and there were some issues there. Uh, there were not proper controls and uh, procedures. There were some issues with post-retirement employees. Uh, under uh, the, you know, the uh, codes of the state of Missouri, any teacher uh, or school employees receiving retirement payments, uh, they can't get more than 550 hours uh, uh, per year uh, and they can't earn more than 50% of the annual salary that they had when they were uh, working. That's actually state law, and we found that there was no monitoring of that going on as to whether they were complying with that aspect uh, of the state law. 
Uh, there's an issue about related employees and nepotism, uh, hiring friends and relatives. Uh, the district does not maintain a list of related employees and board members, and the district has not established adequate policies and procedures regarding hiring, supervising, or tracking of related employees. And that's all I'm going to say about this tonight because there are other people looking in to that issue. Uh, electronic signatures. Uh, the HR department automatically applied uh, school board president secretary's electronic signatures without running them by those people. So sometimes signatures were applied without people knowing that those signatures have been applied. Uh, we looked at personnel records. Uh, those are required to be kept in, in great detail uh, for school employees, uh, district employees. We found that they were missing very important documentation in some cases, such as employment applications, resumes, educational transcripts, employment transmittals, appraisals, and letters of recommendation. Uh, we also found the HR department did not, not maintain a personnel file for maintenance, parents as teachers, nutrition services, or Hilliard Technical Center employees. There were no uh, files maintained at all uh, for that. Uh, we were also concerned a little bit about the personal use of district vehicles. Uh, certain members of the district uh, uh, report use of a personal vehicle as compensation, but then to counter the increased tax liability, the district would pay those people money. That creates all kinds of tax issues and potential liability uh, there as well. Uh, neither the personnel policy nor the school board authorizes personal use of district vehicles, and the district does not monitor the usage of those vehicles. We had some issues with vacation leave payouts. Uh, the district does not have a policy governing vacation leave payouts to retiring employees, uh, nor were they authorized in employment contracts or otherwise approved by the school board. The district method of calculating unused leave payouts may have caused some unintended additional costs, which you can read about in a little more detail in the audit. Uh, for example, some leave payouts were calculated using all compensation, including all these stipends, which would change the amount that's paid. Others did not include the stipends, so they were inconsistently uh, applied. Our recommendations always flow naturally from what we find. Uh, segregate payroll duties to the extent possible. Require post-retirement employees to maintain timesheets so that we don't violate the 550-hour uh, law. And the district has said they are fully committed to implementing these recommendations, and we're pleased about that. Establish procedures to ID, identify and monitor related employees, obtain related party information, and verify with each employee periodically to make sure there's no improper hiring of related employees. Uh, district said they will do that. Uh, make sure when electronic signatures are used that the person whose signature is being affixed has a, consented and agreed to that. That will be done. Ensure personnel records are complete and maintained in a centralized location. They've said that will occur as well. And establish proper procedures regarding personal use of vehicles and vacation leave time. If you look at finding number three in your audit, that's where we are now, uh, we found the district inaccurately reported summer school attendance to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, resulting in overpayment of state aid. You all heard uh, in 2014 that overpayment was $1.8 million. I think what has not been made public was we found a similar problem in 2013 with an overpayment of $1.7 million. So there's a lot of overpayments there. Uh, working with DESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the district identified 30 summer school courses and the related 269 students' attendance hours that have been disallowed by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And the reason that sometimes these courses that they take in summer school are disallowed are, for example, the district charged a fee uh, for, for a sponsored course, which means you can't allow it, uh, or the course is primarily an athletic or band-related item, which doesn't qualify for reimbursement or the course was a daycare service. Uh, so those are the types of situations where you shouldn't be asking for reimbursement from Jefferson City, but the district in some cases was asking to the tune of several million dollars. Uh, the district did submit a corrective action plan to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's a good plan. We hope they'll comply with it, and if they do, everything should be okay going forward. It is possible uh, that there were more uh, overpayments by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for prior years, but we were not able to find documentation relative to that, so we couldn't quantify it if it did occur. Um, obvious recommendation from that is improve controls over summer school reporting. Uh, I think that will be done. We're confident that the administration of the school district will be implementing that recommendation. Uh, finding number four in the audit relates to financial condition. Uh, declining state revenue, questionable expenditures, and financial obstacles uh, present a real risk to the financial stability of the school district over the next few years. The school board did approve over $3 million in budget reductions for 2013 and 2014 to help balance the budget uh, due to reductions in state funding. They also approved uh, uh, expenditures and transfers to the capital projects, uh, but we do think for 2014 to 15. Uh, that the uh, capital projects fund, uh, there'll be problems with revenues uh, not uh, equaling expenditures. 
uh, and that's due primarily to increases in employees' salaries and benefits. As you all know, your 63 cent tax levy will expire in August of 2015. That could also cost the school district $6.5 million a year in revenue. Um, the district, um, I have to say, with all the money paid in stipends, I would say the district would not be in the condition it's in had those stipends been uh, under control. Uh, there was a, a situation that may be a, a slight understatement. Um, the district, <laughs> And I, don't, and I don't mean to make fun of anybody, but it is a serious financial issue. And when you're, when you're projecting a potential shortfall and you're finding 25 to $40 million in stipends being paid off, you know, that's a problem. Um, the district also sold bonds through negotiated sales instead of competitively, uh, did not always procure goods and services in a competitive manner, and did incur, incur some unnecessary expenditures, which I'll talk about in, in just a minute. Um, you also have some bonds that are called QZA bonds, the Qualified Zone Academy bonds. That's a federal government program by which the bondholder actually gets a tax credit rather than an interest payment. Uh, we've seen this in a few others. The Grandview School District also had that type of a program going on when we audited them. But to be eligible, the district must have written commitments from private entities willing to make contributions equal to at least 10% of the bond proceeds. We found that there were serious issues with complying with the QZA program. Uh, the district had not kept separate accounting records for all QZA revenues, which is required by law. And expenditures for the 2013 issuance, which was about $2.7 million, uh, uh, did not uh, uh, identify uh, proper categories of costs and costs incurred. Failure to spend 100% of the bond proceeds for the qualified expenditures within three years can also result in the forfeiture of unused bond proceeds, which would be really basically just giving money away. So we hope that will be corrected as well. Uh, the bond compliance officer did not issue the required report on compliance with the district's tax and securities law compliance procedures also. So that required report needs to be issued going forward. Uh, bond financing, I mentioned uh, there was over $31 million worth of bonds in 2012 and 2013 that were sold through negotiated instead of competitive sales. I did an audit a few years back covering the, the statewide situation, and we determined that if school districts statewide would use uh, competition rather than negotiated sales, meaning you compete out and try to get the best interest rate you can get for the school district rather than simply negotiating. Statewide, we could save about $10 million a year for school districts. So we're very big advocates of competition. Part of our job is to advocate for competition because the fact of the matter is that's the way our free market system works. With more competition, you get lower prices. With less competition, you get higher prices. So we're asking, of course, that the school district ensure separate accounting for bond proceeds, uh, file and required reports, pursue open competition. Uh, and uh, I think that they'll give serious consideration to that uh, recommendation. I want to talk a little about procurement procedures, uh, the way the school district buys things, whether it be services or goods or construction or engineering, whatever they might need to buy. I want to talk a little bit about what we found with respect to the procurement procedures used by the school district. Uh, the district did not obtain quotes for playground equipment, almost $70,000, lockers, $15,000. For P cards and fuel purchases, there were frequently no competition, uh, and there was a 3D printer purchased for $45,000 without uh, any justification for why there was no competition or looking for multiple bidders for that. Uh, the board policy does not actually require competitive bidding. Uh, a lot of school districts do for purchases over a certain amount. Sometimes it's 5,000, sometimes it's 10,000, sometimes as high as 15,000. We recommend that there, there be an actual requirement for competitive bidding at a certain level. You all can decide what it should be. Uh, it's a good practice and it should be put into practice, we think. Uh, professional services, uh, the district does not have a comprehensive policy about procuring professional services. Uh, there was a lot of sole source purchases, meaning they didn't go to multiple people, they just went to one person for such things as special education services. That was a $264,000 contract during our audit year. Professional development services, about $180,000. Behavior consultation and training services, $56,000. Uh, and primary legal counsel, $55,000. Engineering services, there's actually a state law that does require competition for engineering services. We found that the district had not procured mechanical engineering services uh, in a competitive way uh, for air conditioning projects in 2012 and 2014 as required by state law. And actually, you all do have a policy regarding engineering services. Um, payments for those services in 2012, 13, and 14 totaled approximately uh, $415,000. And as I said, there's a state law requiring competition for that type of services, and you actually do have a board policy there. Solar panels, the district negotiated solar panel costs with the vendor and awarded the project uh, sole source rather than competitively. 
uh, negotiated cost of $362,500, uh, comprised of five annual lease payments after which the district could renew it. Uh, there's uh, uh, the total project could cost as much as $2.1 million. Again, it may be a fair price, but we like to see competition in situations like that. Uh, the district also um, had some issues with uh, prevailing wages. Uh, there are requirements that certain wages have to be paid. Uh, and initially for that project, they were not paying the prevailing wage, but I understand that problem has been uh, corrected. We also always look at project files. When there's big engineering services contracts or when they're installing solar panels or building new buildings or things like that, we want to see uh, complete files. Uh, we had uh, problems finding uh, bid documentation for bidders who did bid on contracts and didn't receive awards. The district basically retained a bid summary document, but not the actual bids and the actual underlying documentation of those that have bid on contracts. Um, there's also a requirement um, for construction projects, a state law requirement. This is just for construction projects of public advertisement of bids for construction projects exceeding $15,000. And there were problems with that documentation. In some cases, there was no documentation. So our recommendation, of course, always flows from our finding. Uh, we need to see competitive bidding for purchases in accordance with board policies and state law. And where there aren't board policies, there should be. Uh, and we would expect that all significant purchases, you can pick the number, 10,000, 15,000, whatever it is, would be subject to competitive bidding. You will save the school district money if you do that. Um, contracts. Uh, this deals not with procurement of goods, but performance of the contract once, the, once, uh, once there's a contract in place. We found that there were situations where the district did not always monitor contracts effectively. In some cases, did not enter into written contracts as required by state law. Uh, the district did not require their transportation services provider to comply with the fuel contract requirements. The district did not enter into fully executed contracts for some services before contractors provided the services. Sometimes the services were started and the contract was signed after the fact. Um, affirmations, uh, for example, um, there are, um, in the E-Verify program, there's a requirement that anybody participating in that uh, verifies that illegal aliens were not, were not hired and being used to perform that contract. That's actually a requirement to, that there's an affidavit executed and that did not occur. So again, our recommendations are make sure you're monitoring your contracts, make sure you're, you're following proper verification requirements and attestations. Um, let me talk a little bit about disbursements. That's payments made out by the district to different organizations. We reviewed, you know, we can't review them all, or we would be here for years. So we picked 50 disbursements totaling almost a million dollars for 2012, 2013, and 2013, 2014. Here's the type of thing that we found. Uh, there was, uh, for example, several purchases were coded to incorrect accounts. Invoices for some expenditures were not submitted, resulting in the school district paying late fees. Uh, there's also um, some issues with the alternative certification program that the district uses. Uh, the alternative certification program offers non-traditional methods to obtain teacher certifications by allowing individuals to teach while they're completing their certification requirements, and that's a good program to have. A lot of districts have that, and the district will often pay tuition for participating uh, employees. We found that the Human Resources Department did not document approval of employee participation in those programs, did not report tuition payments as taxable fringe benefits or document justification for not reporting them. Generally, the IRS requires that if there's a certain amount, if the value of that alternative certification is over $5,000, it has to be reported to the IRS or you could have some federal tax liability problems. We found some issues with noncompliance in that case as well. Uh, so we're asking again that the district uh, provide additional oversight of disbursements, including approving a monthly list of bills paid, which was not occurring and does occur in most school districts. And the district has already implemented that recommendation. Uh, and uh, that they make sure that they have a written uh, policy for alternative certification programs and they comply with all IRS requirements relative thereto. Finding number nine relates to purchasing cards. We found that the district does not monitor or limit purchasing card uh, effectively. Uh, for example, there are certain limits uh, that are not always followed and in some cases the limits are excessive. Many employees have monthly cycle limits significantly greater than what's necessary to cover their actual uh, needs. Uh, some people even had as high as a $50,000 monthly limit. We didn't see a reason for anybody to have something like that. Most of us are, don't have credit cards with limits that are that high. 
Uh, as of April 2014, the district had 154 peak cards assigned to various personnel departments and schools. Annual peak card expenditures are $2.7 million, so it's a lot. Now, um, now, we think most of those expenditures are justified. I'm not saying that money was wasted, but we thought that there was not adequate control to make sure that these people really needed to buy these things and they really needed to have those high of a limit on their peak cards. Uh, as for purchases, we reviewed about $90,000 worth of purchases from 10 peak cards. We do a sampling. We don't look at everything. Uh, and we found several uh, issues with them. Employees purchased items with peak cards that were specifically prohibited by the district purchasing card manual. Uh, so there were some unauthorized purchases made there. You can read more about it in the audit. Several purchases appeared to us to be unreasonable or did not benefit the school district. Uh, travel, for example, to a superintendent summit in Tampa, Florida, which the district paid for relatives to attend as well, uh, would not be appropriate. Uh, furniture purchased for the offices of certain district employees uh, appeared to be excessive, including $1,500 for a painting. Uh, the district did not bid or receive quotes or receive school board approval for several very large P card purchases, including a spa uh, and a wellness program gift cards. If you add those two together, you're talking about over $50,000. Uh, district also made routine supplies purchases from several vendors totaling more than $15,000 during the 2013-2014 year. We found problems with documentation of purchases. Some invoices were not signed by uh, cardholders. And in some cases, we couldn't even uh, locate key forms or documentation. Um, our recommendation is better controls over the purchasing cards. Uh, this is not an uncommon finding. Uh, people get a card and they just kind of go crazy with it sometimes, and it's very important for people to really monitor those cards because there's a lot of potential for abuse. We did not find any theft here. We didn't find anybody charging you know, their personal items on the school card, but when you have really high limits and a lot of cards out there and not monitoring, there's always the potential for that. So I'm not saying any inappropriate purchases occurred, but what I am saying is the controls in place necessary to ensure that there's no improper purchases were not we're not there. Uh, the district is fully committed to improving the purchasing system and has already implemented significant changes to the P-Card system that we think are good and show a positive direction for the school district. Um, I'm not going to go through all the rest of the audit. Those are the main findings, but we did find findings, problems with cell phones, tablets, and internet service. Uh, you can read about that in finding number 10. Uh, there was a, a lot of money paid, over $100,000 in some cases, for high-speed internet uh, to members of the school board uh, in some cases. Uh, people we didn't even know who they were were getting high-speed internet paid for uh, by the district. Uh, capital assets. Uh, inventory control is a significant issue in school districts. You know, in the old days, 20, 30 years ago, inventory was like this podium or this table, and no one stole that stuff, so no one really worried that much about inventory. Well, you know what inventory is today. It's iPads, it's cell phones, it's things that can be stolen, things that have value. So we're really asking across the entire state, not just here, for much tighter control over inventory because it's so easy to steal it. When we did the Kansas City City School District uh, recently, we found, uh, it was a couple years ago, I think we found close to $2 million worth of unaccounted for electronic inventory, uh, which most we think had just been stolen by people. So it's very important that that be uh, corrected, uh, that physical inventory be done on a regular basis, and that if there's something missing, there be efforts to monitor it. If it's electronic equipment, you can actually put something in the equipment that it can be located uh, if it's stolen, so you can actually find who stole it and bring that person uh, to justice. We found some significant issues with fuel use and controls. I will go into all the details. You can read about it. But basically what we want to see is that people aren't using gas for their personal purposes rather than for they should be using it just for school district purposes. And we aren't saying anybody stole anything, but what we're saying is the records weren't good enough for us to tell. Um, sunshine law. Uh, this is very important to members of the media. Uh, you know, when you close a meeting, and it's also important to a lot of members in the district, people who live in the district, people are entitled to attend school board meetings, and normally there's a presumption that they're open to the public. But there are legitimate reasons you can close those meetings, for example, to discuss sensitive personnel matters. Uh, in the case here, we found that the board did not always comply with the Sunshine Law and held numerous improper closed meetings meetings that they said were closed and had to be closed for legitimate reasons under the Sunshine Law, but when we actually look, we get to look at what they discuss. They did not appear to be properly closed. This is a common finding in school districts. Uh, we don't know that there was any intentional misconduct. We're just asking for people to be very careful because when you deny the public and the media access to a meeting, it has to be for a very, very specifically defined purpose, and the people have to be entitled, are entitled to know why you close the meeting. We found that there was some looseness uh, with that aspect uh, of the situation. We found some problems. Uh, 
with the computer controls, uh, it would be easy for unauthorized people to access computers. You know, hacking is a big deal these days. Some, even some of the most secure systems are hacked. Uh, we felt the district really needed to take it up a notch in making sure you don't have unauthorized access to your school computer system. Uh, password controls were weak, there were problems with backup data, and there was not an adequate disaster recovery system because in some cases if the system goes down, there would be no way then to access those records due to a lack of a backup situation. So we asked that all those be fi fixed. There was a couple of problems with restricted funds. Sometimes the district received gifts and they were for use for a specific purpose. We found that the accounting for those to make sure they were only being used for the specific pur purpose authorized was inadequate. And so we asked that those be improved as well. Uh, there were some problems with the school store. Uh, the high school store, for example, school personnel did not use functions available to them, functions the district could provide to record sales and maintain inventory balances, and did not conduct periodic physical inventories. Uh, we found a problem with the previous internal auditor had a conflict of interest, which we've identified in there. We understand that issue uh, has been resolved. That is a very quick summary, 35-minute uh, summary of a very long report. Um, I think that it's easy for people to get really mad, and it's easy for me to look like I'm out here trying to shame people. That is not what our objective is. What we want to see is improvement. There were serious problems. We probably never received more hotline calls in our office than we did about this district since I've been auditor. There were a lot of concerns. It turned out those concerns were very legitimate concerns. And you, you all who contacted our office, you all who asked us to do this audit, who, who basically inundated our office with requests, uh, you had reason to ask for that audit. And we're really proud that we came in here. We had a great team in here that did it. We are not interested in anybody hurting or, or causing any trouble for anybody. What we're interested in is seeing that the problems are fixed. That's what we're interested in. And we will be back. I think we're going to give the district a good amount of time uh, because, you know, we found a lot. So normally our 90-day rule uh, is, is the rule we come back 90 days later. We're willing to give you all a little more time. We will be back. And I will tell you, when we come back in three, four, five months, whenever it is, if all these problems are fixed, I'm going to be the first person to say you can be confident that your school district is now well run, the problems are behind you, and nothing would make me happier than to be able to do that. It's an honor to serve you. I love my job as state auditor. We're here to try to improve the situation. Thank you for bringing these problems to our attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody has a question, you can just step up to the mic, and I can stay for about 10 minutes, and i got to hit the road. Thanks. Questions? Members of the media? Did I cover it that well? <laughs> yes. Please step up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When returning to review uh, the, in three or four months the compliance of the audit recommendation, I assumed that the recommendations of the audit concerning future years will be followed. But with examples of personnel receiving higher salaries without proper qualifying conditions, will the state audit review the situation to determine if these present salaries are adjusted downward by the Board of Education? Well, what we're going to see is we're, we're going to come back and make sure that any salaries that are in place are on the approved salary schedule and that nobody's getting more than what's on the approved salary schedule. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, please come up. I probably don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not going to use it. Um, you repeatedly use the term um, the district, the district, the district. Can you explain to me what the district as a legal definition is and which way this information is flowing? Do we look to our Board of Education now to, to find a way to be comfortable with the information flowing down to them? Right. And is the circuit breaker an administrative issue not communicating with the board, or is it the board not providing proper oversight or a combination? It's, it's a combination of the two. And, and as I said when I started, I don't like to point out individuals. That's for other people to do. If, if, there's an, if there's personal individual misconduct, that's for law enforcement to look at. And they are looking at that. And I don't know what the answer to that question is going to be. But what we found were that some problems came from the superintendent's office. In some cases, it was the HR department. So a lot of cases, the board was kept in the dark about what was going on. So you couldn't blame them. In other cases, though, their oversight should have been better. So it's a combination of all those things. But should they have been aware of all this? Or, or, it, or is this just something that we just need to fix? It's something we need to fix. I mean, you know, school board members are, I found to be conscientious. We have no issue with the level of conscientiousness here, but there was a lot of information they simply weren't getting over a long period of time. And I would like to thank the board of
of education for all the work they've done. I really would. Everybody deserves it. I can take a couple of more questions, if anybody has any. Uh, in the back, yes. We aren't going to, but what I'm very pleased the district has agreed to do is they're going to post all of our all of our recommendations online, and you're going to be able to track their implementation in real time over that period. That's a process that was first done by the Rockwood School District outside of St. Louis, and it's proven to be a very effective model because then you all can really be engaged uh, in the process as it, as it uh, unfolds. So we will come back after this. We'll, we'll work out with the board what the right period of time is and issue another audit report. But my understanding is the district itself is committed to letting you know that progress along the way, and I think that's a very, very good way to do things. Um, the, the takeover by the state is a completely different criteria. That has to do with performance and test scores and things the auditor does not look at. So we would not be involved in that. Yes? It was both. Um, one was the, to if you look at the total number of findings, it's very high, but also the total number of dollars involved in that stipend system. I mean, $25 million over eight years, maybe $40 million over 14 years. That's a staggering amount of money, and that's why it got the lowest rating. Yeah, I mean, what ended up happening was you all see something about here's how much somebody's supposed to be paid, and that bore very little relationship with what people were actually being paid. So certainly there was a loss of institutional control, yes. It's very common, though, across the state. I've been on a little uh, effort to try to change that. I'm act in fact, I'm actually, my office is sponsoring legislation in Jefferson City to try to make it mandatory. Many states, many states around the country have mandatory competitive bidding of bonds. We're one of the states that does not. Yes. Um, there is no requirement for an audit. I mean, that you, have, you have your own requirements for an internal audit or for your own auditor. For the state auditor to come in, it's entirely within our discretion. Most of the time when we come into a school district, it's because we receive a petition. There's a, pro a petition process where if you get a certain number of signatures, which is established by state law depending on the size of the school district and how many people voted in the last governor's election, once we get the signatures, we are by, by law then required to come in. But we do discretionary audits too, and we usually do them when there's a lot of hotline calls coming in and when we, when we have reason to believe there may be a problem. So this was a discretionary one. You know, if you, if you add up the total number of entities I have to audit around the state, it's something like 10,000. Uh, if you add up, the, add up the number I can do in a year, it's about 150. So we really have to prioritize. Thank you very much. It's an honor to serve you all, and I'll hopefully be back here in a few months just to give you all good news. Thanks.